thank you for coming. My name is Joseph Pedro Martinez. I'm a guest researcher here at SALT. Um, this is part of the ongoing project, One Day Everything Will Be Free, which will be partially here at SALT Beolu, with some projects in SALT Galata, and also some projects online at SALT Online. Um, over the next two days, we're doing a program, a series of talks called Futures and the Options. Tomorrow, we'll have presentations with Oskar Kuchkan, Caleb Waldorf, who's here today, and Matteo Pasquinelli, who might be here today a little later. But today, we're going to hear from Eva Weimer, and Laurel Tapp. Um, yeah, I, I first came across Eva's project online, actually, through an open call that she released through the Art Agenda. Yeah. Which is a part of the flux. It was an open call to submit work to the piracy project. And I was starting to think about questions of open culture, piracy, intellectual property. And it was a it was a really attractive project. I sometimes work as an artist, I submitted work to Ava's project and I've since kind of followed it in that capacity. Um, but recently within the context of doing one day everything will be free, I thought it'd be interesting to invite Ava to bring the Piracy Project to Istanbul, uh, but also to come with it. She started the Piracy Project, and she'll speak more in detail about this. She started it in London, in a context that I feel is very different than the working conditions we have here at SALT. And uh, yeah, I thought it might be a really productive moment to think about the Piracy Project in Istanbul at SALT Galata, at SALT Research. So if you get some time, maybe after this presentation, or perhaps you've already been, you can visit the Piracy Project. It's in the vault on the ground floor of the Salt Galaxy building. But so right now we're just we're gonna have a short presentation from Eva, and then open this up for a Q and A. I'm hoping that um, you guys can ask her some questions, specifically about the open call, this uh, piracy platform that she's setting up here for the remainder of the month. And then we're gonna have a second presentation uh, immediately after that with Laurel Attack, and then we can open this up again for questions. But um, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for coming. And um, Joseph and Sot, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this gathering here um, in Istanbul. I'm really, I really look forward to the next uh, days, or today and tomorrow, uh, to the discussions. I brought with me to Istanbul um, a suitcase full of books from the Piracy Collection in London. And as Joseph just said, we installed it at Salt Galata in the vault. And we, uh, we will be there every afternoon from 3 to 6. So the piracy collection will be open um, every afternoon. And we uh, show it to you. We have discussions about it. Um, the collection is constantly growing through our own research, um, but also through submissions and we call here for contributions in Istanbul. If anybody is interested in the topic or wants to contribute a book project, please get in touch. Um, I would like to spend my time here in Istanbul, which is another two weeks, um, to learn about the local use on cultural piracy and about, about examples or manifestations or projects that deal with similar topics. So please get in touch. Um, this is um, the email address and publishing. Um, a, central, a central question in my practice is how to make public and for which public. I test, tested or I test in my own work different formats of bringing work into circulation intervention into the public space, working with newspapers, broadcasts, um, the internet. I guess it, fo it focuses on finding or creating an audience for my work, an audience for whom the work has a meaning. Um, this quote, um, the definition of artistic activity occurs first of all in the field of distribution is um, Marcel Brota's response to an invitation um, by an artist, Herbert Distel, to contribute a work to the Museum of Drawers. 
Protas refused to take part. And his response here refers to the old paradox whether a work of art is a work of art even if it's not seen by anybody, even if it's uh, locked away in a drawer. So is the fact that a work is seen by others crucial, a crucial condition of its existence? I think yes. In my own practice, the works are a tool to communicate an idea directly to a public. So, the definition of publishing is the process of production and dissemination of literature or information, the activity of making information available for public view. These images I shot at a peace rally in San Francisco, and I think this is a beautiful way to publish. These placards are taken through the streets because it is there that an immediate audience can be found. The same principle applies to a series of short interventions I did into corporate language on the streets of London. With these interventions into the meticulously elaborated appearance of a brand name, I undermine its established set of meanings. Um, with this strategy, I am appropriating already existing formats or systems of circulation. Here, for example, I appropriated a neon sign displaying the name of an accident insurance company based in Munich in Germany. We see here the front of um, the newly erected office building with a proper neon sign displaying the company's 24-letter name, Holzberufsgenossenschaft. Every individual letter of the word can fade in and out, thus offering a range of 100 new words which can be configured with the existing letters. We program the words which get picked up by a random generator which also decides on the sequence. At dusk and throughout the night, the logo starts to speak. Enigmatic messages, grammatically not always correct, but rather associative. In a way, it seems as if the insurance company's logo itself has had an accident. Of course, the context, in this case the insurance company's logo, and the format becomes an integral part of this work and it can't be thought without it. There's a really interesting quote from Michel Sato from The Practice of Everyday Life where he says, the means of diffusion are now dominating the ideas they diffuse. That's a very interesting quote, certainly for the practice of artists publishing and artists' work where you are looking at something that by its very nature is meta-critical or is reflecting or looking or pointing back at its own conventions. We wanted to test this proposition and started end publishing. Together with artist Lynn Harris, um, we started end uh, in London two years ago. We share the interest in the immediacy of print, of print on demand. Print on demand stems from the just-in-time production philosophy introduced by Toyota in the 70s, which started to produce cars only in response to orders, making only what is needed, when it's needed, and in the amount it's needed. Applied to publishing, this means small and flexible print runs, up to only one copy, and low production costs. This allows for experiments with, with new modes of producing. We launched also a self-publishing platform and public for artists and writers to self-publish and distribute their work through our website by only bringing together already existing print-on-demand services like Lulu, Blurb or the Newspaper Club together. 
So the, the, the ethics and the philosophy of this, of end public, of self-publishing, it's a horizontal approach to art production. It, it creates a critical framework to produce and discuss and freely disseminate self-published works. I'm very interested in the name ends of the meaning of the conjunction end. It's not either, it's not or, it's end, it's accumulative. It allows end, end, end. End publishing is hosted by Centro St. Martins um, School of Art and Design in London, where I'm also teaching, occasionally teaching. Important to stress that end operates independently and autonomously. It's an interesting position to be in because we don't have to assess students, we don't have to report to the university, we don't have, um, but we have daily we have daily encounters with students and staff is in a very creative climate for both sides, I think. But we are not under the governance of the university and this causes occasionally problems. We've been called free floating anomaly which actually sounds a quite good position to be in, I think. In this context, um, the library at Bayern Shaw School of Art uh, used to be, Bayern Shaw School of Art used to be an independent art school in London and merged with Central St. Martins a couple of years ago. And because it's too expensive to run two libraries parallel, um, the decision was made to close down the library at Bayern Shaw, where we are located. Students and staff at Bayern Shaw were very upset, and with the support of the then acting dean, we started to run the library as a self-organized space. This new reading room, it's not a lending library anymore, it's a reading room, is running now for 15 months, self-organized. There are several activities happening in this space, and one of them is the Piracy Project. The Piracy Project is a collaboration with artist Andrea Franchi, who did um, research into book piracy in Peru. And because there was no budget for new acquisitions for the reading room, we felt we should build up a new collection. So we started to build up a collection of pirated books. We sent out an open call asking people to select a book which is of value to them and to make a copy of it, a hard copy. Now, every time you copy something, you modify it, whether intentionally or not. We ask contributors to be aware of this creative potential and to use it as they wish. We publicized this call worldwide from posters in art colleges in London to international art newsletters, and so far we, we received over 120 books. These pirated books vary immensely in their strategies and approaches. They go from reprinting books which are out of circulation to appropriating content or recontextualizing cultural works. This is a snap from our online catalog. If you go to the End Publishing website, the Piracy Project, you have the link collection where all the projects, all the submitted projects are catalogued and um, described. The collection is still growing through submissions but also through our own research. One of the interesting things about the collection is that each of these books <laughs> brings up different issues in relation to piracy. For this talk, I selected a few examples which I think are raising interesting questions. This is, for example, a contribution by Mark Fisher, who is based in Chicago. He runs the Public Collector website, and it's concerned with circulation. He, on, his, on his Public Collector's website, he makes accessible selected books, essays, and other discoveries so that knowledge, ideas, and expertise can be shared and exchanged. Public Collector's website is not intended to be used for buying or selling objects. The title of this book is The Unforgettable Fire, drawing by survivors of the atomic bomb. 
It is comprised of a collection of drawings by the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. The book is out of print, and Mark felt that it's a very important book that should be brought back into circulation again. So he sent us the PDF, which we printed and put the book in, into the collection. Another approach is shampoo, silenced by Kaiser Lasinaro. It's a project about modification, and what she did is she erased all the dialogue lines in the original screenplay by Warren Beatty. And it, shampoo is a film from the 70s, by leaving, this is a, a film still, it's, it's a quite, quite a funny, entertaining um, comedy. And by leaving only the action lines in the play, she created this really interesting script that reads like an existentialist movie, very serious, in which people never directly communicate. It's like somebody goes into the room, somebody else comes in, they look at each other, one looks disgusted, the other leaves. It's a great project uh, because of its conceptual simplicity. Another contribution is by a Canadian artist. She sent us um, the book International Copyright, Principle, Law and Practice. And it's printed through Lulu. And when you flip through the book, you find this very familiar page. Um, she downloaded the, the whole book from Google Books, and at Google Books you only get a couple of pages um, content, and then the rest of the pages show you the message. Uh, page 185 is not shown in this preview. So she... she she kind of reversed the process. Google Books is scanning the original books, puts it online, she downloads it again and transfers it into a hard copy. And by doing this, she is reflecting how we access and how inf information and how information is controlled, um, in this case, through Google Books. This is a project by a Swedish artist, Kaiser Dahlberg, and um, it shows you a page where you see heavy markings and heavy um, annotations. And it was a project she did for an exhibition in Berlin, uh, based in Berlin last year. And her approach was she gathered, um, it's a Virginia Woolf novel, A Room on, on Its Own. Of, on one's own, a room on one's own. And what she did, she gathered, sorry? All right, she gathered all the copies um, of the same edition of this book uh, from Berlin public libraries and copied the markings and the comments and the, the marginalia on the margin and collated all the marks into this one book, into this one copy. So. This copy shows you um, how other readers experienced the book, how other readers responded to the book with their markings, with their marginalia, and all this is copied in this one book. I think that's a, a really interesting way to reflect that a book is something we respond to and it's not a kind of um, abstract object. Another project we, um, is, we bought is actually the Jonathan Safran Fur book. It's published by Visual Edition in London, Tree of Codes. And what he did is he cut out words in the existing novel by Bruno Schulz and created a new narrative with the already existing words. He doesn't mention Bruno Schulz in the project, so Bruno Schulz's name, the original author, is not, um, he's not authored. And this is really interesting. He was asked um, 
about his approach to the project, and he said, um, some things you love passively, and some you love actively. In this case, I felt the compulsion to do something with it. Um, I think this quote takes up my point um, in the introduction that works or a work needs to be animated by the reader. This book had a very active reading. It created something completely new. Um, at least this is Safran Fur's perception. Um, as, as I said, he does not credit the original author. We have uh, this book in the collection, which is, was not submitted by an artist. It's really challenging our um, understanding of authorship. Andrea Franke found the books, the two books, during her research in Lima in Peru. So on the right hand side, you see the original book, No se lo digas a nadie, by Jaime Bailey, and on the left, it's the pirated version. It's um, slightly bigger, the pirated version, and uh, you see a photoshopped cover. Um, the back is cut here, so this has been replaced. And pirated books are widely available in Peru. This example shows a recent trend in book piracy where pirates edit two extra chapters without warning the reader. The chapters, as Andrea said, they are in Spanish. I can't read them, but Andrea said they are really well written and the unprepared reader wouldn't be able to distinguish. And that's um, really stunning. What's the motivation behind this? And how many secretly modified books are we reading? Here you see the index page. Yeah, how many modified books are we reading without knowing? This is really subversive and it unsettles our trust in how we read books and how we access knowledge. We are rather used to copy and paste in the digital realm, but in a way we still trust the authority of a printed book, a hard copy, partly because of its production value. Analog printing, like lithoprinting, offset printing, su suggests um, that the book is some sort of finite product, it's an end product. You print big editions and you edit carefully until the book is exactly what you wanted, a finite pro project or a finite object. But technology now is changing profoundly and digital files are exchanged between writers, publishers, printers all over the wor world. And due to digital print and very small editions, which can be printed and revised and published and again revised and so on, in the case of the Peruvian book pirates here, who creatively edit to the TV presenter's confessions, technology went hand in hand with the intention to infiltrate in other authors' books as a playground for their own imagination. He, they almost hijacked um, his name and his authority and start to, to fiddle around with this. I think this discovery is really challenging our um, understanding of authorship. And the books in the piracy project are questioning the kind of romantic cliche of the inspired genius who creates entirely based on his or her originality and creativity and does not depend on previous learning. So the project makes visible that culture is a process that's always building upon itself. But this prop proposition, of course, clashes fu furiously with current copyright and intellectual property law. <laughs> we tend to mix authorship with ownership, says Louis Hyde in his just published book, Common as Air. He explains how the scope for the creative individuum is curtailed by intellectual property jurisdiction in the interest of a few monopoles and corporations. 
I'd like to play you briefly um, a, sh a very short clip produced by the Motion Picture Association of Australia in which the purchasing of a bootleg copy of a Hollywood film is compared to the theft of a car or a handbag. Let's see when that works. I mean, this is really interesting because, oops, uh, oops, <coughs> because um, a car or a handbag once stolen is not available anymore to its owner, while the appropriation of a book or of, of a work of art, of an article, um, leaves the original untouched. And jo there's a really interesting essay written by Jonathan Lefem um, with the title The Ecstasy of Influence, a Plagiarism. And this whole essay is, pl is plagiarized, but with other people's words and thoughts, but he makes it transparent at the very end. So Jonathan Lefem in, in this essay um, says comes up with the proposition that buying a bootleg film is nothing else than lending a friend a book. And he wonders whether lending a friend a book is illegal. I think um, that's really interesting. And um, there's this wonderful quote by Thomas Jefferson, um, the uh, American founding father and inventor, and he says, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his candle at mine receives light without darkening me. So, copyright is important for the individual creator for a short time that allows him to make a revenue and an earning. But I'm totally against the, the monopolizing and the commodification of culture. How can you own culture? Can you have the copyright for folk songs or tales which get told and retold again? I could not believe, but Jonathan Lethem in this essay I just mentioned claims that the American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers still claims a fee for Happy Birthday 114 years after it has been composed. That copyright can be exercised creatively demonstrates an example Louis Hyde has given in a lecture at Harvard. He talked about James Joyce Ulysses, whose rights are owned by his daughter, who allegedly did not allow public reading, readings in Dublin on Bloomsday, for whatever reason, we do not know. But according to Hyde, the Irish government suspended the copyright law for one day to allow the public reading to happen. So, as I said before, culture is a process that is always building upon itself. Western literature, for example, is a perpetual project, uh, process of revisioning, of transforming. Most Shakespeare stories came from somewhere else and, and are not original. Nabokov, for example, stole uh, for Lolita, he stole not only the character Lolita, but also the name Lolita from a writer he met in Berlin in the 30s. Jonathan Lapham's essay is full of examples of this practice of copying, blundering, and, and more or less transforming. So, we, um, the Piracy Project, we recently got the chance to visit China and see how the question of originality and copy is playing out in Chinese culture in the present. We heard all these recent stories about fake Apple stores in Kunming, or the recent news about a Chinese developer in Guangdong planning to build an exact replica of an Austrian village, including the shape of its famous lake. 
We went to Beijing and had a studio in Kaochandi, which is a small village at the outskirts of Beijing, where Ai Weiwei built his house and his studio, and where his design company is based. Five years after he returned from New York, he talked to the mayor of, of the village looking for a plot of land, and um, the mayor gave him a, a vacant plot where the villages used to grow vegetable and said, well, it's not legal to build on this land, but we will not stop you. I, I way built this um, studio, which we all know from the news, and um, it, he designed it as a very minimalist cube studio. He used grey bricks, they are very unusual in Couch and D, and the bricks became in a way his trademark, inspired by Manhattan um, warehouses. This style became so popular in Couch and D that he was commissioned to design several other buildings, mostly galleries in, in Couch and D. And the villagers quickly realized that there was money to be made with this type of building, so they started to create copies of fake architecture. Fake is the name of his design studio. So, this is a fake. This is a fake fake. This is fake. This is fake fake. Fake fake. Um, fake. <laughs> oops, oops, oops. Yeah, this is fake. So, walking around Khao Chang Di became almost a game of trying to guess which buildings <laughs> are fake originals and which are fake copies. And we wondered what does I Wei Wei think of the popularity of his design and all the replica with the pirated designs. Is he upset? Uh, we don't know, but in an interview he said he got so bored of so many grey brick buildings that were copying his grey originals that he started to build with red brick. <laughs> Another phenomenon we encountered in China is Shanzai. Shanzai is um, the Chinese neologism, which means a new word for fake. Originally, the term related only to pirated mobile phones. Today, it covers all, all, all spheres of daily life in China electronic goods, books, fashion, and architecture. Shanzai literally means mountain fortress. It refers to a famous novel, The Bandits, from Yang Zhang Moore, and it tells the story how in the Song Dynasty, local rebels, peasants, merchants, monks, um, hide in a mountain fortress to find with makeshift tools and weapons against corrupt authorities. Shanzai in general refers to a do-it-yourself culture, um, to copying and imitating tools which are not as well made as the official ones. And the same applies to Shanzai gadgets, like mobile phones. They are flexible and adapt quickly to specific needs. The pirates discover gaps in the market and react promptly. This is difficult to achieve for big tech corporations because of their long-term production processes. So you see here um, an example of iPads in three different sizes. Um, they have an USB and an Ethernet port and um, on the other hand they run on Android <laughs> and the screen is not as sensitive as the original Apple screen. You get Shanzai for, um, copies in different quality to meet your budget. Here is the packaging of two iPhones, both are pirated. So the high quality pirate has a crisp photography on the cover and a silver apple printed on the side, whereas the cheaper pirate version has an almost faded image, no apple label on the box. Both however, have a dual SIM ability, you can have two SIM cards at the same time. What sparked our interest was an article in Wired magazine by Bobby Johnson, who reported um, how technology companies go to China to pirate the pirates' innovations. Nokia, for example, used Shanzai phones as an inspiration for dual SIM ability. 
So in a way, the Shanzai is a free research and development source for big technology corporations. It's important to stress that when you talk to the Shanzai sellers on the streets or in the markets, there's a real pride in it. They don't try to sell you an Apple phone. They are very transparent. You buy a Chinese iPhone. And there's a, there's a, a real subversive aspect to Shanzai as it's subverting existing power monopoles and, and uh, controls by constantly coming up with new variations, playing with established labels, um, turning them almost into parody. And, and it certainly gradu gradually develops into something different. Here, for example, the I Prince, <laughs> don't know how to pronounce it, um, plays with the worn look of the iPhone label. The upper bit of the letter H is scratched off, seemingly by usage, and the O is not a closed full circle anymore. I want to briefly come back to the novel I mentioned earlier, The Bandits from Liang Shangmu in the 13th century. Um, it's not only the content, which I mentioned, the peasant riots against the corrupt upper class, which refers to Shansai, but also the genesis of the novel. The authorship cannot be attributed to an individual author. It was a collective authorship, which created many different versions and adaptions. It had, at some point, 70 chapters. Other versions had 100 chapters, or so even more. The German-Korean philosopher Byung Chul Han published yeah. recently the book Chan Tsai, and he's arguing that in China, in general, cultural products are not related to individual authorship. They are of collective origin. Literature and art gets rewritten re all the time, adapted, modified according to current views and local values. So, Looking at this prolific creative activity, which is freely building upon each other, we have to think of the current debate about intellectual property and the stop online piracy movement, for example. It might be simple to be against piracy, but there are all sorts of ambiguities and questions about how much can culture be owned. I don't want to end up, of course, with no motion picture industry, certainly not, but funny enough, the German Association of Cinema Operators commissioned a research study last year, which found out that the very same people who watch videos illegally on streaming websites are the very ones who spend the most money going to the movie theaters. The study has not been officially published. <laughs> So, claiming ownership is a deeply problematic debate, and just if we look back at the projects in the piracy collection, here are um, the shampoo screenplay, which has been silenced. Is it infringing copyright? Is the transformative part substantial enough to call it a new work? We don't know. It's a grey area. It's um, funny that Warren Beatty, who wrote the screenplay, is actually borrowing an older play, The Country Wife, a restoration comedy by William Witcherly from 1675. Um, of course, this is out of, the, out of copyright because it's um, longer than 70 years after the death of the author um, regulation. But it still demonstrates how we build and depend on each other, other's ideas. So, hopefully, um, this has given you some things to think about, and hopefully you are inspired to get involved and to develop a project or contribute a work to the piracy collection. If you would like to get more info how, just send us an email. <laughs> and I will be in Istanbul for the next two weeks 
and will be manning the piracy collection at Salt Galata in the library um, every afternoon from 3 to 6. So if you want to talk about your idea, so if you have an idea or you want to bring a book for the collection, um, just come along. Also, if you, um, if you know about interesting examples of cultural piracy, local piracy in Istanbul, for example, please come by and tell me. I would really like to learn as much as possible about um, the local context here in Turkey, um, even beyond the, the art context. I'm interested in cases where people um, take matters into their own hands and subvert existing structures and frameworks. So you find either me or Joseph um, at the library at Salt Galata. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Eva, for your presentation. I wanted to ask you quickly uh, two questions, and then and then let's open this up for a quick chat. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have tea. You know, we have some tea that people can have, and then we're gonna have Laurel's presentation. Uh, but before that, I wanted to ask you what this means to take the piracy project on tour, because it seems like in the beginning of your presentation you outlined how it develops in a very specific context. In some ways, it's a reaction to the merger of these two institutions and this library space becoming redundant. And then a group of students and faculty coming together and saying, no, we're going to self-organize, we're going to do a project here. So the Piracy Project develops out of this very specific context, but then it ends up on tour. And people like me end up sending you invitations. Why do you accept my invitation <laughs> to Istanbul and show the project here? I'm kind of curious um, what, what that's come to mean for you. And you've shown the project in New York at the Art Book Fair, and Berlin at an Art Book Fair there as well. But in Istanbul, it's, it's quite a different situation. And then you'll subsequently be showing the project again in London in possibly September or October. Well, I think there are probably a couple of answers to these questions. One, one answer is that it's very interesting to learn how other cultural settings respond to it. And by taking the books, or by traveling with the books, showing the books, discussing the books, we, we create discussions and conversations we create questions and responses, which means um, the project expands. It's, it's, really, it's really malleable and it develops and, um, and we, we get new contributions. I mean, we build up the collection. So it's, it's, it's uh, two things. The collection grows and the research expands through all the conversations we um, it's a, it's a re I feel really lucky because I think it's a really rewarding way to research, research through conversations and research encountering people and um, yeah, I th this might be an answer. <laughs> can, you, can you tell me if you've found any examples, have you, have you had any contributions to the privacy project so far in Istanbul? Yes, um, we have, uh, I have three new books, so two contributions um, by Istanbul-based artists and one book which I um, found out through conversations with Istanbul-based artists. Um, I, I, I just bought it the other day in the bookshop. You all know it. Um, it's um, Ahmed Shuk. And I think it's really rele relevant for the piracy collection because um, before his manuscript could be officially published, you probably all know about it, uh, he was put in jail. And then 120 authors authored the book and published it. So through this multiple authorship, uh, nobody could be made responsible. And this is um, interesting, the, the dispersal of authorship becomes here a tool for free speech. And um, I think this is why it should go in the collection. 
Okay. Um, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Make a comment? <laughs> Is it possible to zero to your books? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think so. Um, I, I have to check with Salt uh, how, how about the facilities there. Not, about not here, but in general. I mean, if somebody is interested to multiply them. Yeah. Did you ever you know, try that or somebody was interested? In no, we haven't tried. No, we haven't tried it. But um, it's, it's raising an interesting question. We um, printed. Um, we, we, we took the collection to Berlin in, last November to the Miss Reed Art Book Fair and created a reading room there. And um, for this occasion, we printed um, a catalogue of all the books we had in the collection at this point in November. And we thought um, we make this, this book a uh, creative commons, so no copyright. But then we said, well, we, we can't really do it because we, we don't on the rights. I mean, all, all the projects in a way are probably infringing copyright. We don't know. We would have to check. But um, So it's, it's interesting who, who owns the right of the pirated books. And, and this um, is probably the question, whether they can be pirated again. I think, yeah, if you take the responsibility to pirate it, you're welcome. You take the responsibility or permission to tour them. Can be you know can open itself from there to different uh, this, different placement or different multiplicity. You know? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for making this known here. Um, I I would like to turn towards your sort of implications, theoretical or practical implications of, of this work. And uh, what I see in it, and you said it, you, you link author with authority, ownership, and authorial authority. Yeah. So the question is, uh, do you, I mean, do you think, do you think, do you have research into how the spreading of this kind of practices uh, may shift uh, the attention from the individual as it was produced from Renaissance to now, and which is the basis of our capitalist type of organization towards something else, and what that something else may be uh, sort of diffuse production, which is rediscovering what happened before. Renaissance, but with added technology. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that uh, people are inspired by other people's work is, is as old as creative production. I think so. Uh, through all times, people have been copying other people's achievements and work with them. Um, what is the potential of this matter? What, what is with this matter? What's the potential of? Of oh, dismantling something, but what's that something is? If this sort of gets generalized, which I would like to <laughs> You are asking what's the potential to make it transparent? Yeah, and this. <laughs> yeah, sorry. What, what, what this kind of movement, if it would be generalized, what would. Who feels threatened? What would dismantle? What is the potential of dismantling something? And what is that something? Why people feel threatened? Why? How do you think about it? I have my idea. Well, that, yeah, I think there, there, there are several agendas. The one agenda is the kind of mythologization of the kind of genius and just make it clear how actually culture works, how we re relate to each other. And then the other point is that at some point, um, commercial interests kicks in the copyright and that copyright is um, of course great to kind of um, protect the author for a couple of years and to allow him to make a sort of revenue but it's not okay 
when big corporations kind of sit off it and um, uh, um, fight or um, just um, <laughs> what's the English word? Sorry, um, do not allow that interesting things can happen with it, with in, with inventions and innovations. I think these are the two agendas in a way. I don't know whether I have answered your question. Thank you very much for the presentation. Just have a comment and a question. Because you mentioned when you start discussing, because introducing and publishing, you stress the fact that and publishing is independent and it's extremely important to be independent. But at the same time, I think you know, when you talk about collective authorship, and collective authorship is about somehow dependency, each author depends from the author, and also your project, I guess, somehow depends on the contribution of the authors. Oh, yeah. So I see, you know, this kind of sort of contradiction. So I would like to know what you, how you intend the independency. And for me, it's a crucial question because exactly every time that I think, okay, I'm running the publishing, and I define myself as an independent, but then I start thinking, okay, but maybe independence is not the right word. So I'm just wondering how you define independence in relation to the fact that collective authorship, and if we intend authorship as a collective process, then it's a process of dependency. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, very true. I think when, when I used the word we are independent and we were autonomous, it was clearly directed to the institution and all the problems which come with it because, um, you know, um, the University of the Arts in London, it's a, a, a huge institution which um, builds up a huge management and all the money is put into the bureaucracy and, and not an interesting project. So uh, we, really, uh, we really try to keep a distance to this and ex actually to be this kind of free-floating anomaly. Um, so this this is where independence is um, is necessary and where a distance is necessary in order to make interesting work and allow collective works to happen. I, I have a simple question. There's no PDFs of any of this available. Of the pirated books? Mm -hmm. um, only from artists who send us the PDFs, but we haven't started to scan the books. Is there a plan to, to do that, or does it, is it important that they remain in their kind of material form as objects? Well, it's a really interesting question, because um, I feel I'm too precious with the books, because some of them are unique books, and they're just amazing, and now when they are in the world, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. I, I wake up late night and say, oh, the book is, is not here anymore, so it's really difficult with this question, so it, it might be, um, we need to kind of think of it and probably it would be good to not have the unique thing but to scan it and to produce um, copies. It's a bit relating to Bono's question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something, there's a couple of ways to think about it, but the PDF also is very different than the ebook, let's say. Right, so like a scanned PDF is a kind of has an intimacy to it that like the ebook doesn't have, right? Because all of the kind of the sketching, the underlying, all the messiness of your finger being on there and your hairs and the scanners is still present on the PDF. But yeah. there's this kind of shift happening within digital publication where the PDF and the kind of um, the, the material space of that is actually being lost for the kind of cleanliness of the ebook. So I don't know, it's something interesting to think about, but there is that kind of, yeah, there's a kind of intimacy that's shared as well when you're circulating that kind of document versus, yeah. in, you know, an Apple ebook that you can't share, actually, fundamentally can't pass mm. that around. Mm. Um, yeah, we'll take it step by step, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, the first is, I'd like to ask, um, 
the uh, your comparison between the Peruvian pirate copy and the Tree of Codes uh, was quite intriguing for me because you called the uh, Peruvian pirate copy as subversive and the other as more interesting. And I wondered what oh, is the uh, or that's what I understood. Yeah. And from that, I thought, what is the legible amount of intervention to make uh, some uh, pirating strategy subversive or uh, to make it still original? Is there uh, this uh, level of intervention? That's the first question. Uh, the second is... Oh, can I just answer this? Because yeah. I can't remember it. Um, I think the Peruvian pirate book is really... Um, it's, it's really stunning because it's challenging really how we how we trust books and because it's not authored. I mean, this is the difference to the Safran Fur. Uh, with the Tree of Codes, you've got the artist or the, the writer's name big on the front cover, so it's authored and in a way you know this is his book, whereas the Peruvian, they pretend um, it's still the original author's book. So there's a this is very, very different, and um, probably the fact that we discovered the Peruvian pirated book is, uh, to me, uh, much more interesting than, than Safran first book. My other question, um, if uh, we consider uh, Lafarge's point in the mode of production determines the social structure, uh, I want to ask, um, do you or do you think that that accumulation of different uh, piracy strategies points to a definite or um, distinct mode of production? And if it does, uh, what does this mode of production, that let's say new mode of production that is compiled of these different uh, strategies, uh, tell us about the social structure? I don't know whether there's. Um, whether, I think there are many different strategies how people approach piracy, and especially lots of different motivations why people pirate stuff. So uh, one would be to gain access to knowledge. Um, there's, for example, when we've been to New York at the New York Art Book Fair, we had many many conversations with people, and we met um, a librarian who built up a library in a juvenile detention center in the States, which is basically a jail for kids. And she built up this library, and because um, there are regulated reading hours, which are quite short, she started to photocopy the books. Uh, so she created a sort of shadow library, a pirated library, and gave the books, the kids, um, into their cells for nighttime reading. So. I think, for example, this is in a really interesting project, and you can clearly say there's a specific motivation, there's moral motivation behind um, pirating books. Whereas um, other projects have a creative motivation, and um, I, yeah, I don't think we can just pin it down and say this is the strategy and this is the kind of um, aim. What would be your position if one of the books published by a publishing would be pirated by um, the photo of your, for example, and then just to be profited and sold for a uh, small price? I would be upset <laughs> because I have to make this really, really clear. We don't sell the books in our collection. We don't make any revenue. This collection is put together because um, it raises so many interesting questions and because we want to discuss these issues. So if anybody tries to rip me off, I would be upset. Thanks for the presentation. Um, what's the copyright status of your uh, general cultural works? I mean, from texts to images or any cultural works you produce. 
Do you use any free culture licenses? If so, particularly what? If not, why not? <laughs> Um, you mean generally anything I did? Cultural production. Yeah. Yes. What is built on? Yes, culture builds on the past on itself. So, uh, do you uh, make your works freely, as in freedom, not in beer? <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about reunions, etc. But uh, what's your effort to let? and no others that they can build on your work so that the culture builds on itself. Because if you don't declare it clearly, uh -huh. yeah, your work is in the conventional copyright, but there are free cultural licenses, but not the creative commons, I mean. Not, oh, yeah, it's not yeah. a license, a set of licenses. That's why I'm asking what particular license, if you have a few. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we discussed um, licenses for the piracy collection, but as I explained, um, we didn't get far with it because of the reasons I mentioned. And um, the collection itself, I think this is um, interesting. Who owns the collection? Because lots of people contributed to it, and it's not us uh, or not indi the individuals who are running the project. So we created a commons. It's a commonly owned collection. And um, what exactly this means, we have to figure out. Um, but I think this is the right way to, um, to deal with it, to approach it. No, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about, in general, your texts, your works of art, your images, whatever you produce in means of cultural production hmm. or artistic production. For your own work, what do you use any free culture licenses? No, I haven't used free culture licenses. Why not? Then talking about this potential of all this stuff here. I don't know how to apply a free culture license to a neon sign at at an insurance company. I think um, it, it's it speaks for itself. I don't know how to, why should I license it? I don't expect somebody to do the same work. The work is site specific. It responds to a certain context. So how can culture build on your cultural work? If I, for example, <laughs> if I'd like to appropriate that work that you appropriated the work. Yeah. So if I want to appropriate your work, how should I know that if I, if you give me the right to appropriate and you are happy for me? I guess you would appropriate it anyway if you like it and if you can um, build on it. No, this is the problem. The copyright law says you cannot. You can code, but of course you can be sued in any, any way. But the copyright law says no, you can. So I, I don't know that I can ap appropriate your work and build on it. Yeah, I so guess you know, so building on it doesn't it. mean to imitate it. Um, building on it means to be inspired and to have some sort of creative transformation. And I think then a copyright, I know that it's a really tricky and gray area where copy, copyright lawyers litigate all the time. Um, yeah, I just had a meeting before I left to Istanbul with one and she said, you know, what we do is just an educated guess. It's really hard to put down the rules. It's really hard to um, define it, how transformative your production or your approach have been or how deriv derivative. So, um, yeah, I think it doesn't make sense to, oh, well, it might make sense. I, I'll consider it to license um, such kind of work. I think I have another question up front. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and maybe it sort of gives a different way of framing what, what was just being asked, but how do you feel a, about PDF sharing websites like R or library.nu, which just got shut down, or Wikipedia.info? Because the thing is about um, uh, academic publishing and arts publishing is that authors and artists don't make any money, right? Like, So there shouldn't really be a concern that your book being pirated is somehow going to make you lose like, 
yeah. a little bit of money that, that comes out of it. I mean, basically nothing. You get paid, you get paid in cultural capital. And by having your work circulate, increases your cultural capital, which gets you a yes. to do certain things. So I think that it disaggregating the economic from the cultural is, a, is, is an important thing. So I'm just curious then, how do you, how do you feel about PDF sharing websites that exist that are primarily on maybe exist on that ethos that it's more important to have the thought and ideas out there because there's no economic benefit really to having to writing a book and publishing it in a traditional sense unless you're you know selling millions and millions of copies which most academic publishers yeah, or artists totally. are not doing. I, um, I think Arg is an amazing platform. I, I use it a lot and um, I I think um, that, that authors themselves put their texts on it. So it's it's a mix of um, illicit and legal contributions, and um, yeah, I think it's a great platform and it's really useful and it really fills a gap. Uh, I just was wondering, if, uh, you know, you Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, and we are just wondering ourselves because um, when we research Shanzai in China, it's, it's a very similar approach, but it's so playful and it's so um, it has this pride, and um, it's a very very different um, thing than talking about piracy. But I think in our context, at the library, which was shut down, we really wanted to make a, a gesture as well because um, there was no fund, funds available for new acquisitions and then we kind of had to say all right we pirate and uh, and since then we just stick with it um, yeah do you know about the history of the usage of that term in um, the i think um, that piracy really or cultural piracy really came through um, the internet streaming sites and Pirate Bay, and then slowly into kind of the bigger cultural production. So I, I'm not entirely sure when Pirate Bay started, when they, when they, somebody else might know this. Does anybody know? And that was when? 98? Have you been contacted by the uh, party of pir piracy party? No, here, please. Uh, have you been contacted by the pirate uh, party in Germany? No, we haven't. We haven't. Would you be interested? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Um, One last. Do you know about their platform? Yes, yeah. Uh, which platform do you mean? The, the the, the pirate party. Yes, I know the pirate party yeah. in Berlin, yeah. Um, because their platform is pretty much talking to your practices. In a way. Yeah, I, I want I wonder about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I was I was just gonna comment directly on the linking of piracy to uh, cultural production and basically just say that as soon as copyright was invented I mean, copyright itself is a technology. As soon as it was invented and made authorship a limited good, in fact, it was possible then to pirate works. And so in the statute of Anne, which is mm -hmm. establishes copyright um, and, and gives the authority of the, of the Stationers Guild in, in England to print exclusively works of a single author, um, you immediately have the term piracy to emerge. Um, it begins in Ireland. Uh, because Ireland is not part of the British Empire proper, and so the only way to get access to books was to pirate them. Uh, and then Benjamin Franklin in the, in the American colonies was a book pirate early on because he had access to the printing press. And so I think in a way it's important to realize that, that in some ways what we call piracy now is the more natural act, the act of copying. And, 
and that the copyright uh, evolved as a technology to limit uh, right. this and create an artificial boundary, which in some ways just like you know, pesticide limits the growth of weeds, but there's sort of an ecosystem that needs to be kept in balance. And so, um, you know, I think there's a sense in which new technologies can emerge and piracy or kind of co practices that are critical of copyright begin to suggest ways forward for those technologies. Yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. Hey, um, I just have like another example, maybe, I don't know if, 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 if you're interested in anything, but um, like in the Western graffiti, uh, uh, history from the start, like in, in mid 70s, uh, there have always been a tradition of just uh, copying uh, comic books, uh, all types of stuff. Uh, and of course, it was because it was anonymous and illegal, so nobody, uh, uh, there's nothing. Uh, no work uh, by like copyright doesn't exist at all. Like uh, and, and people still do this because you can do whatever you want. Like in some way. Uh, have you do you know anything about this? Uh, um, like the piracy for like just yeah taking others uh, art or like uh, and then just uh, painting it uh, on the street for everybody. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. No, this is not a question. This is more like another example of piracy uh, in, in a form of art movement. Like, like. You, you, what, what artists are you thinking of? Or, I'm, I'm like, uh, it's like in the Western graffiti culture. Oh, right. Uh, so uh, like, yeah, so mm. it's like uh, people have always just taking stuff like uh, uh, Donald Duck, all, all kind of stuff, uh, uh, because it, it, if you don't want to uh, like do something new yourself, you can just take it, it doesn't matter. Mm. And, and, and no one would find out who it was or anything, because it's anonymous, so like, and it's still free for everybody to see. Uh -huh. um, Interesting, yeah, no, I haven't looked into graffiti.